Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Welcome to our time of study in God's Word. This is study number 38 through this series through 1 Samuel. And the title of our study today is The Righteous King. And today we're going to look at 1 Samuel 26. Would you please join me now in prayer? Lord, we are reminded today that without you, there there is no justice. There is no truth. There is no life. And Lord, we... Lord, we just come before you and we acknowledge that you are a God of of justice, a God of wrath, but also a holy God, a God of love who has sent forth his, your son, Jesus, uh, to die in our place and for our sin to forever and finally appease and to satisfy the, the wrath of a holy, just God. So now we might know your love that's, as Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, has been poured out for us in our uh, for us so that we might know you be declared not guilty to be sons and daughters of God and so Lord as we look at first Samuel 26 today I, I pray Lord that we would grow in our in our confidence in your justice in your holiness in your love in in knowledge of the gospel so Lord I, I pray today that you would illuminate this text to us, give us understanding of it, and help us, Lord, by your Spirit to take this message and to apply it to our hearts and to proclaim it faithfully in the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to 1 Samuel 26. 1 Samuel 26, and we're going to look at all 25 verses in this chapter, so hope you're ready. And uh, here's, here's what they are. Here's what they say to us. God's word to us. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hekilah, which is on the east of Jeshimon? And so Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hekilah, which is beside the road east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. And when he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. And then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, with Abner the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. And then David said to Amalek the Hittite and to Joab's brother Abishah the son of Uruah, Who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishah said, I will go down with you. And so David and Abishah went down to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping with the encampment, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. And then Abishah said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishah, Do not destroy him. For who can put his hand out against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But now take the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. And so David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head, and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. And then David went out over to the other side and stood far off from the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? And then Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over the Lord your king? For for one of the people came in to destroy the king your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die. 
because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. And Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is is uh, is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now therefore let my lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day, that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. And then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son, David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is a spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put you out of my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me from all tribulation. And then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and succeed in them. And so David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. On May 11, 1685, 18-year-old Margaret Wilson was condemned for refusing to swear the oath of abjuration, that notorious statement of allegiance to King James, not only as sovereign ruler over Scotland, but as sovereign over the Church of Jesus Christ. Margaret was most willing to acknowledge the king as her secular sovereign, but as a Christian, she could not swear the rule over her soul to anyone but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, she insisted, was the sole sovereign over his kingdom, and into his hands alone she committed her eternal destiny. For this crime, Margaret was tied to a stake in the Solway River, awaiting the inrushing tide. And tied farther out into the water was her older companion, Margaret Lagesson, so that the younger Margaret could witness her drowning and reconsider her obstinate refusal to swear allegiance to King James. Well, you see, young Margaret was undaunted by this spectacle, declaring that Christ was himself suffering in her friend. And then as the water swirled towards her own post, Margaret recited aloud the eighth chapter of Romans, concluding with Paul's great promise that that not even death can separate Christians from the love of God in Christ Jesus. On came the waters, and after she had suffered for a while, Margaret's persecutors removed her from her post. Displaying her on the beach where she gasped for air, they asked if if she would pray for King James. She would pray for his salvation, she assured them, since she says this, I wish the salvation of all men. But would she swear the oath of spiritual allegiance to Scotland's king? I will not, she said. At this, a soldier pushed her weakened body back into the waters and held her underneath until she died. We live now in a time in which professed Christians in the West are scarcely bold enough to withstand even the fads and the fashions of a culture in rebellion to the rule of Christ. Margaret Wilson would surely reprove us as Jesus taught to not to fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather than fearing him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10.28 says, Moreover, her advanced experience with worldly powers would direct us to ponder the words recorded in the Psalms in Psalm 118, 8 through 9. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. If Christians need instruction in not trusting worldly powers, Israel's King Saul provides a convincing master class in this. 1 Samuel chapter 26 presents Saul's depravity once more. On a second occasion, when David graciously spared an enemy who was at his mercy. You see, because the similarity between chapters 24 and 26, in which David forbears to slay King Saul, critical scholars are united in denying the historical accuracy of the accounts. 
assuring us that two such similar events cannot be accepted as being possible. And yet, just as with the other so-called discrepancies in Scripture, only an independent knowledge of the events in question can prove error in the Scriptures. Lacking these and believing the Bible's testimony to be the inspired Word of God, we have good reason to accept the events of 1 Samuel 26 not only as genuine, but also instructive for our faith. Admittedly, not much has changed in Saul since the last appearance. In this, he well represents the wicked corruption that afflicts all earthly powers apart from the saving grace of God. Now, now notice, for instance, how ready Saul was to commit evil. The chapter begins with, with David taking refuge once more in the wilderness of Ziph. Well, critical scholars, they, they doubt that David would return to this place of prior betrayal, which we saw in 1 Samuel 23, 19 through 20. But, but there cannot have been too many suitable hideouts for David and his band of 600. History did in fact repeat itself, 1 Samuel 26, 1 says. The Ziphites came out to Saul at Gibeah saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hekilah, which is on the east of Deshimon? Given Saul's word at the, at the end of his prior meeting with David, outside the cave of Engedi, where his life had been spared, we might expect the king to ignore this intelligence. Saul had, after all, vindicated David of treason in 1 Samuel 24, 20. We might expect Saul, therefore, to send the Ziphites away with a warning to leave David alone. And yet exactly the opposite happens. 1 Samuel 26, 2 says, And so Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. What explains this about face? Well, the answer is that the man in sin is ever ready to commit evil. This reality is all the more true of men and women who exercise great power and whose graceless hearts carry the weight of privilege and authority. Consider the never-ceasing news of political leaders today who one after another fall prey to sexual sins, to dishonesty, to fraud, to cover-ups, despite the proven likelihood of their being caught. Why do they leap at opportunities to sin? Because having, been in, having inflamed themselves with the, the hot passions of power and pride, their depraved natures draw them into self-destroying sin. Had Saul not figured out by now that God was not going to permit him to take David's life, as he himself admitted after the last meeting. And yet, how irrational sin is in the mighty. How could Scotland, Scotland's king think that, that publicly drowning a teenage girl would enhance his spiritual authority? How can communist deposits in China today fail to notice that their persecution of house churches only causes them to grow? Well, the problem is the corruption of man's depraved nature. It is ever ready to commit sin and to forget God's punishment for those who do evil. This is a problem that's not only confined to the high and mighty. Do you, having seized the sovereign reins of your own life and choices, not realize the peril of sinful desires? It is sin, not faith, that is blind and ever ready to follow one disaster with a renewed zeal for another. Well, aware of this tendency, David had not trusted himself to Saul after the king's superficial penitence at Engedi. David's wise answer reminds us of Jesus' response to the superficial praise he received in the early months of his ministry. John 2, 24-25 says this, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people, for he himself knew what was in man. You see, Christians who gain in wisdom regarding the world, learning the truth about its depravity from God's word, will understand what Margaret Wilson came to know early in life when she entrusted her soul only to Jesus, even at the cost of an early exit from the realm of the wicked and the, and the worldly kings in this life. You see, as we've talked about, there is no compelling reason to see chapter 26 as merely another version of events in chapter 24. Anyone who has been in an abusive relationship like David will, with Saul, can tell you that the same scenes tend to be replayed over and over. Contrary to liberal claims that these chapters are too similar to be true. And most importantly, by reflecting on the material found in chapters 24 through 26, 
we can discern an important advance in David's spiritual understanding and maturity. Whereas Saul returns unchanged by his experience, David's experience under God's tutelage has brought about a notable growth in the grace of God. We see this in the unfolding events at Saul's military camp. Learning of Saul's advance from his scouts, David went forward to see the enemy host for himself. Saul was encamped on a hill besides the road on the east of Deshimon, 1 Samuel 26.3 says. There, there David spied Saul's entire host asleep on the ground. And seeing Saul himself at the center with his general Abner nearby, David proposed to go down to the king in his camp. He asked, will you go down with me into the camp to Saul, 1 Samuel 26, 6 says. His nephew Abishai, the son of Zerulah, David's sister, agreed. And so David and Abishai went down to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping with, within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the army lay around him, 1 Samuel 26, 7 says. Just as his followers had urged David in the cave in Gedi, Abishai asked David for permission to pin Saul to the earth with one stroke of the spear, 1 Samuel 26, 8 says. David refused, 1 Samuel 26, 9 says. Do not destroy him, for who can put on his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Instead, David decided to take Saul's spear, so well known as a symbol of Saul's hatred against him, and the water jar near the king's head. With these possessions, David and his companions stole away into the night with no one waking since a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them, 1 Samuel 26, 12 says. So David gave Abishai two reasons for not slaying David. The first was that God's people must never seek their own benefit by violating the word of the Lord. Saul had been appointed king by God and must therefore be shown reverence and respect. We see this principle affirmed in the New Testament when Paul commands Christians to be subject to the governing authorities, Romans 13.1 says. You see, we are to fear God and honor the king. We are to pray for the princes and those in authority. We are to recognize that God is an instituted civil government and it is to be obeyed. But we need to be clear here. This does not involve rendering to Caesar what belongs to God as Scotland's King James required when his soldiers drowned Margaret Wilson. Nor does it justify violating God's law in order to keep the commands of men. It does, however, require respectful conduct towards the person and the office of civil rulers. David's example urges us that, that this respectfulness is called for especially when God's people may be in opposition to government policies. In a dem democratic nation such as America, where citizens have the right to contest the policies of its leaders, Christians must be careful to treat national, state, and local officials with the personal respect due to those who have been established in office by the Lord God. See, David also realized that it would be sinful to take personal revenge against Saul, a lesson that had been uh, magnified in the previous chapter. Abishai's lusty offer to pin Saul to the earth with his spear shows all the marks of vengeance for Saul's earlier attempts to pin David to the, to the palace wall with this very same weapon. Alexander McLaren says this, Abishai represents the natural impulse of us all, to strike at our enemies when we can, to meet with hate, and to do another the evil that he would do to us. And yet, to do this is sin, as David knew well. In the recent episode with Nabal, Abigail had reminded him that taking vengeance incurs blood guilt before the Lord. Later, during the civil war that followed Saul's death, David would be glad that he had not endorsed the bloodthirsty message of Abishai and his brothers, at one point complaining that these men, the sons of Zariah, were too harsh for me, 2 Samuel 3.39 says. On this occasion, David did not struggle with the temptation to strike Saul in personal vengeance. We can see the reason why by looking closely at his answer to Abishah in verses 9 through 11, in which David cites the name of the Lord no less than five times. This shows that the way to restrain our sinful passions is to keep God constantly in mind, remembering his word, submitting to his will, and honoring the name of the Lord. David's second reason for sparing Saul was that God's people should not force God's providence. Here was a lesson that David had learned in chapter 25 in his dealings with foolish and greedy Nabal. 
In his wrath over Nabal's insult, David had been on the brink of committing mass murder until Nabal's gracious wife, Abigail, intervened. And in the aftermath, God had taken care of Nabal in a better way than David could ever devise. David learned that this episode to wait upon the Lord in the confident hope that, that he would work out justly and wisely all things. David exercised his sanctified imagination in verse 10, telling Abishah, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. See, David's growth in the grace of God involved his awareness of the sovereignty of God in the affairs of men, combined with the goodness of God, the justice of God, and the wisdom of God. And knowing that he served an omnipotent, sovereign, faithful God who had promised his salvation, David preferred to wait for God's solution to the problem of Saul rather than to force his own. How much better it was in the years to come that David waited for God's timing and for God's solution in dealing with Saul. See, the moral and spiritual authority so necessary to David's kingdom would have been impossible with Saul's blood on his hands. David reasoned that if, that if God intended for him to be king, and if Saul's wickedness stood in the way of his reign, then God would take action against Saul. Alas, into how many sins and even crimes have men been betrayed through unwillingness to wait on the timing of the Lord. Rather than taking matters into our own hands when confronted with a hostile employer, abusive parents, or even a persecuting government, God's people are to wait on the Lord in prayerful humility, refraining from anger and violent retribution. To be sure, David defied Saul so far as his duty to God required, just as Margaret Wilson steadfastly refused to devour King James as sovereign over her soul. But both believers were blessed by humbly obeying God's word as they had patiently awaited God's timing for their deliverance. One way to encourage our faith while we wait upon the Lord is to take note of the many helps that God provides. Consider the mysterious slumber that placed Saul's army at David's mercy. David may not have known it, but, it, but a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them uh, 1 Samuel 26, 12 says, Whether or not we can see how it's happening, Christians can be assured of God's constant aid and protection, even in trials. David wrote in, in Psalm 34, 7 through 8, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You see, the result of David's growth in the grace of God was a corresponding increase in his spiritual authority among the people. In previous chapters, while, while David was learning these lessons, the events related mainly to David himself. But now, armed with a gracious obedience to the word of God, David is placed in a position of great spiritual youth, usefulness to others. Having grown in the grace of God, he is equipped to lead the people of God. And now notice the significance of his removal of Saul's spear. This weapon had become the symbol of Saul's regime, an ever-present emblem in his royal militancy. There it stood, impaled in the ground by the slumbering king, and David realized the significance of its removal. Perhaps this symbolized the ends that David's leadership served, the removal of sin from the realm and a commitment to peace among the people of God. Well, notice also David's boldness in reproving the failure of Saul's army. This is the first time that David not only addresses Saul, but he also speaks with authority to those who have served the king. He upbraids them for falling asleep on their watch, a capital offense in practically every army throughout the history of the world. Having moved to a safe location, David now directs his rebuke at Abner, Saul's general in 1 Samuel 26, 15 through 16, which says this, why then have you not kept watch over your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the lord, the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the lord lives, you deserve to die, because you have not kept watch over your lord, the lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. What was given David the spiritual authority to assume this leadership role? Well, one answer is God's calling on his life to sacred office. But inseparable from this calling is an example of personal godliness and obedience to the word of God. See, David's unwillingness to strike sinfully at Saul had given him a platform from which to exhort others. 
the daily practical godliness of any Christian, and especially of a Christian leader, will grant him or her a credible platform to speak out against sin and corruption in the world around us. But when Christian leaders fall into the same kind of sin so rampant in the world, the moral authority of the church is compromised. Throughout 1 Samuel, we have seen David contrasted to King Saul. From the start, David was intended as God's replacement for the apostate leader. In this chapter, we see then together for the first time, Saul advanced in his depravity and David growing in God's grace. On these respective courses, time has served only to widen the gap between the two. Now imagine how great the gulf is when, when advanced into eternity. The real difference, of course, was the respective relationship with God, which set them on different trajectories. Our standing with the Lord is what matters most about each of us. A relatively moral person who is a stranger to God's grace is, is bound to move in a godless direction, if only in his or her heart. A relatively immoral person who comes to faith in Christ, however, is bound to become more and more holy over time. You see, the same principle holds true for our response to the ministry of the Word of God. Those like David who trust God's Word and humble faith will find themselves growing in the grace of God, starting right where they are. Those like Saul who harden their hearts against the Word of God set their feet on a darkened path downward into depravity, a path on which even present virtues are sure to be corrupted and destroyed. Although we will see Saul again in this book, this nighttime meeting at the camp would be the last time that David would see Saul. David had reproved Abner when, when Saul awoke and recognized his voice. Is this your voice, my son David? David answered. And then, it is my voice, my lord, O king, for Samuel 26, 17 says. This final interview contains three emphases that continue to exhibit David's growth in the grace of God. David was a realist about Saul and did not sentimentalize about this opportunity to speak with him. Instead, David took the opportunity to seek the greatest good for, for Saul's soul, beginning with a sincere call for his tormentor to repent. David's call for repentance took the form of a question. 1 Samuel 26, 18 says, Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is, in on, is on my hands? As in the prior meeting at Engedi, David pleaded his innocence while presenting proof of his goodwill. The spirit and the water jug that evidenced his sp sparing of Saul's life. And despite this goodwill, so, so amply demonstrated Saul's servants had made David a virtual exile from the land of promise. The persecution was tantamount to removing David's share in the heritage of the, of the Lord, saying, Go and serve other gods, 1 Samuel 26, 19 says. This statement reflects the theology of geography at work in the Old Testament. Since one needed to worship God at his tabernacle to benefit from the atoning sacrifices made there. Saul was driving David into the cursed condition of paganism by depriving him of God's sacred ordinances. For what reason has Saul allowed his government to be dominated by the mad pursuit of one mere servant and a loyal one at that? 1 Samuel 26.20 20 says, The king of Saul has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. With these words, David confronted Saul with his mad folly, calling him to repentance. Now, now, many Christians will find themselves driven out from their families, their career fields, or, or other blessings as a result of sinful resentments and hatred. Like David, Christians should take prudent steps to protect themselves and should refrain from sin while waiting on the deliverance of God. But as they have opportunity, they should calmly reason in an attempt to bring repentance. This same model applies to political action in a secular state. Christians should boldly speak the truth regarding matters of sin, calling the government to repentance, but we must be able to do so with evidence of our own godliness and our own goodwill. And now David realized that a mere call to repentance was not going to strike home in a hardened heart like Saul's, and therefore he added a second message, a call to true religion. 1 Samuel 26, 19 says, And now therefore let my lord the king hear the words of his servant, if, if it is the Lord who has stirred you up by, by way against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. Well, David understood this situation. that There were two likely sources for Saul's mad wickedness. 
The first was God's wrathful chastisement. Saul should consider that his impaired reasoning may have resulted from God's judgment on his sins. This is not a message that people today, any more than Saul, are, are to receive, are going to receive happily. But, but David continued by reminding Saul that God has provided a way of cleansing and restoration to his favor, namely the blood sacrifice of atonement. And David knew that in these offerings, God's promise of forgiveness and God's promise of peace. And in this way, he looked forward to the coming of the true and the great sacrifice, God's own son, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist identified Jesus in these terms, crying out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1.29 says. In effect, David was offering to go with Saul to the Lord for their mutual appeal to the sacrificial blood for forgiveness and for renewal. This appeal sets an example for us in our dealings with hostile individuals in a hostile culture. When faced with an intractable hostility, we should invite those who oppose us to meet with us at the ground level beneath Christ's cross, taking the place of sinners who appeal to the grace of God in the blood of Christ. Here, for instance, is where marital harmony is gained and where marital strife is reconciled by mutual confession of sin and mutual appeal to forgiving grace. Likewise, in the Christian witness before the world, we must not merely denounce sin under God's judgment, but also show forth the cleansing grace of God in the blood of Christ, by which even our fiercest opponents might be forgiven and restored to God. See, David couples this with an appeal to a warning about the danger of evil company. 1 Samuel 26, 19 says this, If it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. Once we are reconciled to God through Christ's blood, we must shun the counsel of the wicked if we are to remain in the blessing of the peace of God. As it happened in their prior meeting, Saul responded to David's plea with a superficial repentance. I have sinned, he confessed. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life is precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake, 1 Samuel 26, 21 says. Some would have us believe that the Christians must not only forgive, but also immediately renew our trust on the basis of an assurance like this. And yet David knew better. What was missing here from Saul's confession? There was no turning to God, and therefore none of the deep work in Saul's life that alone could arrest the progress of sin's corruption. Saul was happy now, realizing that, that David could have taken his life. But this goodwill lacked the resources to prevail. He is the portrait of those who today who grieve the consequences of their sin, but not their sin sinful condition itself. Those who insist that they are sorry for their sin, but they resist dealing with their underlying evil by turning to God in true and saving faith. You see, true repentance on Saul's part would have been expressed in a resolve to depart for the altar of the Lord. There to deal with his great sin before God, and only afterward to offer protestations of good faith to his injured servant. You see, David realized the superficiality of Saul's words, and this is indicated by his immediate reference to the notorious weapon in his hands. 1 Samuel 26, 22 says this, Here is a spirit, O king, let one of the young men come over and take it. Now, a repentant Saul would have begged David to keep it, if not destroy it, as an emblem of his wicked corruption. David can only conclude by, by placing the matter into the hands of God, reminding Saul that he will reap what he sows. 1 Samuel 26, 23 says this, The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. See, David's reward for his good faith and his obedience to God's word was not relief from Saul's malicious pursuit, but rather a clean conscience before God and a resolved faith in God's vindication. As Christians, we should all have the same as our, as our goal in every arena of strife, personal and public, acquitting ourselves peacefully and refusing the false peace of an insincere repentance while continuing to wait upon the God of both justice and grace. As we continue our study in 1 Samuel, we will see how God's justice pursues and overtakes a reprobate Saul. What a sad blessing it would be for David on that day to recall in that response to his just and to his gracious dealings 
The last words he ever heard from Saul's mouth were those of vindication of his own cause. 1 Samuel 26, 25 says, Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. And so David went his way and Saul returned to his place. On the same day that Margaret Wilson perished beneath the Solway waters, May 11th, 1685, 17-year-old Andrew Hislop stood before a royal firing squad. His crime had been assisting his mother in offering shelter to a religious dissenter and refusing to swear the worldly king as sovereign over her soul. And when the guns were loaded, Andrew was told to cover his face. With the same assurance in God that David showed before Saul, the young Christian declined. I can look you in the face, he answered. I have done nothing of which I need to be ashamed. But how will you look in that day when you shall be judged by what is written in this book? The muskets fired and the bullets tossed Andrew's body to the ground, his hands still holding forth the word of God to his murders. David had come to realize that if he were to serve as a true king in the service of the Lord, then he must commit himself to being a righteous king. Trust in the Lord, waiting on the timing of the Lord, and submitting himself in obedience to the word of God. In the years to come, David would exhibit a mixed record of success. Although Israel would prosper under his generally righteous rule, more importantly, David typified the greater and the truly righteous king who won the dying allegiance of both Margaret Wilson and Andrew Hislop, an allegiance that they would not surrender even upon the pain of death. Both refused the allegiance of a sin mattering world in order to find salvation in the realm of the true and the righteous king of heaven. Both, in their own way, remind the persecutors of the righteous judgment before which every sinner must must someday stand. The writer of Hebrews ministering to yet another body of afflicted Christians made a similar appeal. He wrote to remind a group of persecuted Jewish Christians that there is a true and a righteous king in whose hands we may safely rest our souls. You see, in Jesus Christ, we see a king who himself has secured the righteousness in which we may stand before the judgment throne of God. Hebrews 1, 8 through 9 declares, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. While the evil powers of this world may may have their day, Hebrews 1, 11 through 12 continues. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. You see, it was in the robe of the righteousness of Christ that David, together with Scottish martyrs, desired to stand before the affront of the earth's wicked rulers. It was for that righteous kingdom that he desired to offer his life as we should today. He would learn, as all martyrs have surely discovered in glory, the truth of what he wrote in Psalm 37, 16 through 18, which says this, Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked, For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the day of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. You see, here's the thing about this. In in Saul, we see a man who who, who has made up his mind about what righteousness is. In our our world today, we have many people like Saul. They think, well, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I'm a good person. I, I've done good things, but heaven's gates are closed to such thinking. It's not about our goodness. Our goodness doesn't get us into heaven. Our merit doesn't get us into heaven. Our, our good behavior, our good conduct, our, our good works, it, it cannot get us into heaven. If it could, then, then guess what? Jesus wouldn't have come to die, but, but Jesus did come. The whole reason that Jesus came in his incarnation as a baby in a manger is to die. Jesus came on a death sentence. Jesus didn't come for for good wishes and and well wishes and for a pat on the back. Jesus didn't perform the miracles that, that he did just for the sake of showing miracles. Instead, what Jesus did in performing his miracles is he showed forth the the radiance of God. He showed forth the rule of God. He was breaking into the world. He was showing, look, I, I'm not just another man. I, I am God. I am fully God. I am fully man. I have power to do this. I have power to, to show forth 
the, the, the glory of God in, in displaying my power through healing other people, through doing the things that I do. In fact, in, in John's gospel, we see the seven I am statements. God is saying, Jesus is saying, look, in Exodus 3.14, it says, I am who I am. And what Jesus is saying is, look to the Jews, look, I am telling you when I say I am, that I am that God. I am the, the, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am has come. I am has come. This is the I am God. Jesus is the I am God. He is God. God in flesh, God in power, God in, God in glory, God in radiance. He is the, the righteous king. And what does this have to do? Well, well in our passage, we see, we see Saul... We see Saul going further and further down his depravity. And, and people object to this today. They say, you know what? God won't give people over to their, to their passions. Th- there'll always be a way for, for people to repent. And part of that is true. God, in, in, in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord desires the, the repentance of man. The, the Lord is not slow to his promise. The Lord desires all to be saved. But, but here's the thing with that. In Romans 1, it says that God gives people over, and we have to reconcile both ideas. And I think the best way to do it is this way. Some people object, well, well God hardens people in unbelief. Well, well we see this, that in, in, even in John's gospel, we see in chapters 5 through 11, what, what, what's happening is, 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 is John is telling this story and of, the, of the Jews continuing to, to harden their hearts and in unbelief against him. And, and, and they're so blind, they, they cannot see the reason that Jesus is doing these miracles isn't just because he is somebody. It's because he's fully God and fully man. And this takes us back even, even to the, the Exodus and to the Pharaoh. Why did Pharaoh harden his heart against the, the Israelites? Why did he keep trying to destroy them? Well, the reason was exactly like Saul. He turned his back on the Lord. He kept turning his back on the Lord. He kept making a conscious, willful decision to, instead of following the Lord, instead of believing the Lord, instead of taking him at his word, what did he do? He kept rejecting the Lord. He kept saying, oh, uh, uh, especially with Saul, we see this. He, he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. But there's no real contrition. There's no real repentance. Repentance is, is not just sorrow. It's not just being, I'm sorry for the things that I did. I'm sorry that I got caught. It's instead, uh, I'm sorry that I've, I've committed cosmic treason. I, I've not just missed the mark. I've, I've committed a holy offense against God. And I desire to turn, turn away from it. It says, yes, I'm going to turn away from it, but I accept the consequences for my sin. I accept the punishment that, that is mine justly. I accept the consequences of the, of the hurt that I've, I've done against others, but I also accept and believe the forgiveness that, that Christ has pardoned me. This is what's happening with Saul. He, he never accepted the consequences. He never was truly uh, contrite in heart and as such, he had false repentance. And this is why his spiral keeps going down and down. This is why, this is why God is just in delivering people over, as Romans 1 says, to their, to their passions and their desires. In other words, what we're saying is this, is that, is that God will honor the request of people. If all they desire is just mere sorrow and not true repentance with, with it, sorrow and re- turning away from it, to, to Christ alone and and asking God to help them to hate that sin, then guess what? God will deliver them over. He will give them over to their sinful passions. This is exactly what we see in our world. This is why exactly why God is just in giving people over to their sin. God desires all people to be saved, but he also knows that he knows the condition, the state of the human heart. He knows where man is is headed. That's what's happening with Saul. with Saul. God knows. God sees. God God cannot be fooled. He sees the human heart. He sees the human condition. He desires all men to be made right with him, but he also knows not all men are going to be made right with him. Because 
what we love is we love what we love. We, we love to, to dabble in a little bit of sin. We, so, we, so our conscience becomes a little more and more less desensitized to it. And then we're following headlong into it. This is what this is the un, state of unregenerate man. That's what Saul typifies for us. The state of unregenerate man. They love their sin. And what sin is, is it's irrational. It's illogical. It, it leads us further down the path towards destruction than we would ever want to go. But in David, what we see, although imperfectly, we see a, we see a man who loves righteousness. We see a man who heeds the correct, as we talked about last week, he heeded Abigail's correction. And then he, he corrects Abishaw. And, and David demonstrates, at least in this chapter, a man who loves God. So even here we see the contrast is clear. We see the state of Saul's soul is one of depravity. He is degenerate. He is a reprobate. He is headed towards hell. And yet, even here, God says, let me show you the opposite of that. Let me show you righteous David. Let me show you what this looks like. In mercy, what David does is he, he reaches out and he calls him to faith. He calls him to repentance. This should be our attitude as well, not just giving up on people because, you know what, they're, they're making sinful choices. We, we are to call all men everywhere. We are to do the work of an evangelist. We are to make disciples. I, I don't, we don't know how far down, that, that, down, the, down the path of sin somebody is. We don't know if, if God has absolutely hardened their hearts. We're not God. We can't, we can't see into the mind and the, the will of God. We can see the fruit. We can see, yes, that person is hardening their heart. That's sad. But, and that's where we should grieve. We, we should never rejoice that, that somebody is reprobate. We should, we should do as David and, and keep calling them to, to repentance, to faith in Christ. This is, what Je- this is the heart of Jesus. Jesus came, Luke 19.10 says, to seek and to save the lost. And what David also shows is, is a complete, is a, is a trust in the sovereignty of God. God. David knew that God would do whatever he would do. He was just the messenger. He trusted and trusted his words, his message from the Lord. But it was, it was what from the Lord. We have a message from the Lord that sets the captives free. Luke, that's Jesus' first sermon in the, in the synagogue was in Luke 4 to, to preach, to announce the glad tidings of good news that he has come on a death sentence to set the captives free through his finished and sufficient work, which he would accomplish and did accomplish in his death, burial, and resurrection. So, so David shows us what a, what a trust in the sovereignty of God is. He shows us that, that we can trust God to do what he will do. And our job is just to be faithful to do what God has called us to do. That is to proclaim the message of glad tidings of good news in Christ alone. That he saves sinners. It's, it's the Holy Spirit's job to come along and to, and to take the, the truth and the power of that message and to drive it home into the hearts of sinners and to save them and to irresistibly by, by grace alone through the Holy Spirit to open their eyes, to give them sight. God does that. But God also uses the, 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 the decisions of our hearts, whether we, will, whether we will walk on the righteous path or not. I'm talking about those who are unrighteous at this point. I'm talking about God himself will irresistibly call those to salvation. But what happens to those who aren't? You know, we, we, we don't have all the answers to this. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that, that God has kept some things secret to himself. He, he has withheld from us. He has told us so much and we have to trust him. That, that's where our trust and the sovereignty of God comes in. God is sovereign and we see that in David. David preached the message and Saul didn't respond to that message. He responded with a half heart of repentance. Our job is our job is to preach the message and to entrust the results to God and that, and, and that God will open that person's heart, that that person will respond to God, to, to God's work in their life and that they will repent and turn from their sin to Christ alone. But God, no matter what, no matter the, whether, the, the, whether the person has a good response or, or they choose to reject the message, God is still good. God is still just. God is, it is not, God's justice is not dependent on somebody's response to his message. 
That's what I'm saying. God's justice is, is just just. He's holy. He's perfect. He's good. He's, a, he's just and the justifier of those who come to faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, think of it this way. What God offers, he says that, that he is the chief shepherd, that he is the way and the truth and the life. He, is, I, 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 he opens the door. He, he provides the way. But, but the question is, do, do people go through that door? Do people believe that door? They have the choice. They have, when the message has been proclaimed, they have a choice. Will they reject the message? Some people hear the message thousands of times, if not more. Some people only get to hear it once. Our job is to be faithful and to trust our lives and, our, and the gospel message, to have confidence in it, that it will do what it will do. It's God's job to, to open people's eyes, to call them to faith, to, to, unveil their, to unveil their eyes so that they can see and know the, the beauty of Christ, so that they might respond, so that they might believe. That's their choice, to believe. And here's the thing. In all of this, God is just. God is just. God, as Romans says, God is just in the justifier of those who come to faith in him. Meaning, God, no matter whether somebody comes to faith or not, God is just. God is good. God is good. God has been good to Saul. God has continued to provide opportunities for him to repent and to, to believe. Our job is to do the same with those who seem to be stubbornly unrepentant, to keep calling them to faith, to keep saying, hey, 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 look at the beauty of Jesus. Jesus is so good. He's so good. He's so awesome. He's so wonderful. He's so wonderful. Keep calling people to the loveliness and to the beauty of Jesus. You never know. God might open their eyes and he might give them sight. Our job is to proclaim and to entrust ourselves to a sovereign God who is good, who is holy, who is just, and who makes sinners right through his finished and sufficient work. So aren't you glad we've been called as Christians to carry forth this message of glad tidings, of good news in Christ alone, to make disciples, but we entrust our message. We entrust people to the message, to the God who alone, as Jonah 2, 9 says, who can save. And God is just. God is good. So you can trust that at a deep heart level. God is good. God is sovereign. So trust him. Trust him to save. Trust him to use your ministry for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we, we just thank you that you are just, that you are good, that you are holy, you are perfect. And Lord, even as we are confronted with, with many people like Saul who are difficult, we are reminded, Lord, that we need to just proclaim. We need to proclaim the glad tidings of good news in Christ alone. So Lord, help us, help us, help us to proclaim to those like Saul who seem so far gone. God, may you even use the message of the gospel, even this message, to open hearts and minds to the truth of yourself. Lord, help us to be, Lord, help us as your people to hate our sin, to turn from it and to, and to trust in you. Help us not to be like Saul, half-hearted repenters, but, but truly hate, being sorrowful over our sin and turning from it. And like David in Psalm 51, asking Lord for you to cleanse us with hyssop. Lord, help us not to be introspective about this. Help us not to be, uh, just to, to find every fault and think, Lord, but to trust that you have made us right with you, that you have justified us, declared us not guilty. You have given us a new nature. You have given us a new name. You have secured our future forever. You say in John 14 that you've gone ahead and prepared a place for us. So we, Lord, we, we trust you. We believe that. Help us, Lord, to obey your commandments. Help us to walk in ways that, that, are, that are pure and holy and uh, although we will do it imperfectly. Lord, give us, give us hearts of repentance. Help us, Lord, to, to walk with you afresh through your Holy Spirit to, to carry forth glad tidings of good news in the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.